I saw an advert for a singer wanted for a rock and roll band back in 1961 when I was 18, or almost 18. And I'd, um, I'd always sung in my head on the bike, going to school, or walking along, you know, always. Um, and I still do it. And I was rather surprised to find not everybody does that. I thought everybody did. And I had a very good li um, memory for uh, song lyrics. So I just used to do that, you know. And uh, the audition for for the group, I, I still what's, don't know. What's the group's name? Huh. Well, you know, they were called the Drifters, and, and as ah, soon yeah. as I joined, I said, well, hang on, you can't call yourself the Drifters. That's that's Cliff's band. Which Shortly was? after that, of course, um, Cliff was made to change into the yeah. shadows because the American Drifters made I've, him do I've it. I've got the first uh, move it, and it's Cliff Rich and the Drifters. That's right, I? yeah. yeah. That, by the way, was a bloody good song. It was a good the only decent thing he yeah. ever did. No, and it had song. a lovely dark intro. I wonder if, if I can do it. Now, that also was a blues mm. because it was call and response. Come on, pretty baby, let's move in a groove. That's definitely good. Don't lose it. I always wanted to play uh, rhythm and blues. Uh, I wanted to. I was well into Bo Diddley and um, and Big Joe Williams and John Lee Hooker and people like that in those days, and no one was doing it. Um, though shortly after, the, you, you found that actually the Beatles had been doing it for quite some time, but they. Uh, it was mostly rockabilly for them, but they were also playing blues. Mm. Um, I think George in particular liked it. Paul probably wasn't all that keen because he was more of a formal musician, really, wasn't he? I mean, he was playing the piano when he was quite young. Anyway, I, I think I was with the band for about six months or so, maybe a little more. Um, I went to the audition. I took my little sister with me. Uh, she'd be about 14, 15. And the reason I did that was I wanted, she was a beautiful little girl in those days, um, and I wanted to kind of take the attention off me. I thought maybe if I brought a girl there it would look very authentic, you know, long blonde hair and blue eyes. They might think that I really was a rock and roller even though I couldn't really sing very well in those days. I sounded like Cliff Richard actually, even when I didn't want to. <laughs> and two others were, were there at the audition, and when I sang my first song, it was uh, Baby I Don't Care. Do you remember Elvis? Don't like crazy music. You don't like rock and roll. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I did that, and one of the boys walked out. And then I did two other Elvises, and the other, the other one walked out. <laughs> I thought, man, I'm doing all right here. So I didn't need my sister's, um, my sister's uh, beauty to help me along. Um, but I took her anyway. She knew that I could sing, because I'd sung to her, but I'd never sung to anybody else. In between that and, and the first real band, the Crawling King Snakes, I taught myself to play a harmonica, uh, and I did this by buying um, a harmonica in um, it was in C, and it was at a, a sale at Murdoch's, one of the huge music shops in in Birmingham at that time. It cost me half a crown, uh, and it was low even for then. But he said he was stock taking, and he said, "Yeah, you can have this. I'd rather I'd rather." sell it than, uh, than count it. So um, I used to go to a record shop in uh, Birmingham called Matty's because they had booths, as everyone had a few years later, but they were uh, early, you know, earlier. So from about 61, very early 62, just after I'd left the first band, I was learning to play the harmonica. That was the first instrument I ever played. I got very good on it too, but I haven't got the lung power now. Have you still got the harmonica? Uh, the actual one? Uh, no, no, I don't think. No, no, I haven't. They don't last very long. Right. I do have some harmonicas that are very old, um, very old indeed. Some of them have got no holes left in them. Right, <laughs> but um, no. It's funny. I didn't even know they wore out. Oh well, yeah. You do, especially the way I yeah. played them. I, I wasn't particularly artistic. Uh, the subtlety came later as my lung power began to uh, <laughs> my lung power began to um, to, to to get uh, less. But um, I used to play really really loud. Anyway, you had to in those days because the amplification equipment we had wasn't all that hot.
I'd go to the record shop and as soon as a record in my key uh, were to come up, uh, I'd get into the booth and borrow it and then play to it. Uh, high heel sneakers was something I played an awful lot in Matty's before they finally told me <laughs> to buy it or <laughs> get the hell away. I went to a gig with Alec, the, Alex Harvey was on in, um, in Mothers in Erdington. Uh, it wasn't called that then, it was still called the Carlton Club. Right. And um, my mate started nudging me because I was sitting there. And um, I thought he, he meant I should stop, so I, I, I stopped. But then Alex Harvey, who was... You know, he was the one doing the gesticulating. He got me up on stage, and I played a couple. I think three with him. Wow. Uh, only harmonica and no, no, no singing or anything. And then um, the rhythm guitarist in the first band, Kevin, must have remembered that um, I'd always grumbled to the band leader that I didn't want to sing Beatles songs. I mean, even at the age of eighteen, I didn't want to sing. My heart went boom when we crossed that room. It was cheesy then, right. you know, even at 18. And was there also a bit that all the girls liked? I mean, was that a bit of it bad to put you off as well? well screaming girls? And no, like no, I like screaming <laughs> girls, but they weren't screaming at me. That was the only reason I didn't care for them. Um, no, no, it was, uh, there was nothing. I mean, we were used to girls screaming at, in concerts anyway. You know, that was what they were for, we thought. Kevin uh, must have recommended me to some friends of his who were looking for a blues singer. Um, because they, they rolled up to the house one early 64. And uh, the upshot of that was we formed the Crawling Kingsnakes. Uh, it was my idea to call them that. Um, the band that, um, that, that, that was the Crawling Kingsnakes went on shortly after, uh, in, in 65, I think it went on shortly after I left, um, but kind of collapsed. But we're part of the Brum Blues um, thing, which, which is... Uh, something I'm very happy to have been part of because that was quite an epoch. You mentioned the Beatles a lot, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the Stones because I would have thought oh, they yeah. would have been bigger. Well I was always very years. contemptuous of Mick's singing right. but um, he was a great harmonica Mick, we, we met them all in, oh yes it must have been the Odeon because it was right around the corner from the hotel we went to afterwards and they were, they were on with, um, oh my god, they were on with Little Richard, uh, Bo Diddley, I think the Everly Brothers as well. Um, the package shows we used to have in those yeah, days. The Everly Brothers were huge at that point as well. Weren't they? Oh yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. Um, and um, we we got quite friendly with um, two or three of the Stones. Uh, Brian, in particular, surprised me. Paul from Alan Stinson, who was a, a, a journalist on the Record Mirror in those days. I think it was the Record Mirror, and. Um, he needed me to bring a, a, a record player and some records because they, they didn't have one with them. And uh, I had a huge radiogram, so I said, yeah, okay. Uh, I said, we'll, we'll, because my friend Bo, he, he and his brother had got this Dan Set type um, thing. I've got one of them at home. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> so um, he, uh, we, we, we took that. They said they'd send a taxi for me. And the taxi was um, uh, chauffeured, not not chauffeured, uh, accompanied, um, was a huge black gangster fellow who turned out to be Jerome. He, he was the maraca shaker for uh, Bo Diddley's band. Uh, he was the wife of um, the Duchess, they used to call her, who played um, bass for Bo Diddley. God, she was gorgeous. She was about six foot two. And we just, I almost fainted when she came out. <laughs> How are you doing, y'all? <laughs> I'd never seen anything like her. And I literally did feel very faint for, for a few seconds. Anyway, he came up to the house. And of course, I had to admit that it wasn't my record player we were going to take. I took a bundle of records. We had to go up to Bo's house. And <laughs> Bo, Bo's record player wasn't working, so we had to... <laughs> <laughs> Pick up Bo and his brother, then we ran around to Dennis's and we got his um, his record player. We went to a party with the Rolling Stones, oh, has anybody yeah. got a working record player? I tell you what, um, <laughs> by the time we, we got Dennis into the car, uh, Jerome was rumbling to himself, you know, in the back seats, and he took up most of the back seats. He was like a black duvet, you know, he was everywhere. <laughs> well, well, <fuck> you, <laughs> so, anyway, when we got to the party, um, we, we were playing all, all the Johnny Hooker and Jimmy Reed records we'd taken, and Brian said to me, you know, our harmonica player knows every single solo in every single Jimmy Reed record, and I thought, hang about, what do you mean our harmonica player? I thought you were our harmonica player, but Brian always thought he was his band, as you now know, mm -hmm. but in those days it came as something of a revelation to me. I had no idea that, um, that he 
Yeah, I thought it was his band. Um, mm. Exactly. But it did start. It, no, no, it did. I think in his early days, he did with Alexis Corner. I think he got the first sort of. Did he? Moves in there, I think so. Well, you um, managed to find a working record player. Yes, Dennis is. It was the Albany Hotel, and, and we, we, we had a really good time there. The party went on until about uh, two or three in the morning. And then we, we were telling, um, I was telling uh, Brian, and uh, I think it was, I think it was Bill. Three of them walked home with us anyway. Mick was out of it right the way through. I never, I never met him. Uh, he, he, he was lying down with his face in his girlfriend's lap uh, um, after, the, after the gig, he was completely out. The other, oh, um, Ian Stewart was it? The, yeah, the road manager. Yes. I congratulated him when I found music. out yeah. what a great piano player yeah. he was. Mick offended me, the fact that he'd got the ideal band, the band that I really deserved, you know. He was the only, he was the only pop singer who was doing that stuff. Right who couldn't sing as well as I could. Practically everybody else was better than me, but he wasn't, he was crap. I always disliked him for that. <laughs> so I started talking about Steve Winwood, whom no one knew yet in those right. days. We, Steve Winwood and his gang, the Spencer Davis gang, they yeah. um, opened the first blues, rhythm and blues club in Birmingham in early 63. So I talked about this fellow, what a genius he was, and I said, to uh, Brian, you, you need to kick your kick your singer out. He's no good. Good harmonica player, but he's no bloody good at singing, and and he's a bit of a popping jay anyway. I probably didn't use that word then, but <laughs> that's what I meant. And he was quite interested in this, and he asked me to take him up to the, uh, the the Golden Eagle at the top of Hill Street. That's just before you get to the town hall, you know, there in Birmingham. Uh, and we we were going to meet them. You know, they were going to when they got a Monday night off. Um, he and maybe one or two of the other Stones were going to come up and um, and have a look, see what they thought of the plays. Because blues clubs then were very, very rare. They had them in London, but they didn't have them anywhere else. But it never happened. And then a little bit, little bit later on, they found Brian drowned in a pool. I've often wondered who did that. Yeah. <laughs> if it's anything to do with me, I'm sure it's. Not. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, rhythm and blues boom came in. You just thought you'd died and gone to heaven and been in yes, exactly the yes, right I place did. at the right time. Do you know, rhythm and blues was pop for a short time, mm -hmm. and I had to admit in the end that Mick was okay because he did a damn good version of uh, Little Red Rooster and he took that Howling Wolf song to the top of our charts. Mm -hmm. Wolf, I am sure he, he he would never have believed that such a thing could happen, but it did, mm -hmm. um, and it was the first blues record we ever had in uh, in the British charts, I think, unless you count. Bad Penny Blues, the Chris Barber instrumental, um, with that left-hand boogie rolling thing that um, Paul uh, liked, and and he got the same pianist to do it in Lady Madonna a little later. But that was a that was a beauty. So what were you doing then during the big blues boom? I, I mean, was in it with the Crawling Kingsnakes. Okay, right. But I was a little bit late. Um, my band were not fully working until the Stones had been going for certainly eighteen months. And of course, they'd already been to Chicago. You know, they learned it. They, they recorded it all over now down there. So they, they left everybody behind. But in a in a strange way, I like being part of, if you like, the the also rans, because the I, subculture. Yeah. Well, I couldn't. Uh, I I I couldn't go to London. You know, I hadn't got the money, just a clerk salary, and um, I had a job. Uh, I just couldn't drop everything, mm. even if anybody asked me to, but I always knew. I may have had my own share of, um, of uh, conceit about my music, but I always knew I wasn't the singer, that I didn't have it, because um, I'd heard by now, I'd heard people like Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, um, uh, Steve Winwood. I knew those people were streaks ahead of me. When I heard Robert Plant, he was about 17. This was somewhat before he stole the name of my band and used it for his own. Um, I just couldn't believe how great he was. He could reach all of those notes that I couldn't. 